Well, good morning. 1 Peter chapter 3, 8 through 12. The title of today's message is Submission Leads to Life. Submission Leads to Life. Let me ask you, what do you want from life? What is the secret to, secret to happiness in life? Have any of you discovered it as of yet? I think all of us want the best out of life for ourselves and for our children, our loved ones, and our friends. How to attain it is the question of the ages and themes of books, seminars, and love songs. But think for a moment. What would you be willing to pay for that happiness and for that good life? What if that cost for happiness, those things that you think that would make you happy, bring joy in your life, what if that cost was high? Not just high, but very high. What if it cost all that you had? One blogger who contemplated this very question wrote, Everyone wants what feels good. Everyone wants to live a carefree, happy, and easy life, to fall in love and have amazing sex and relationship, to look perfect and make money and be popular and well-respected and admired and a total player to the point that people part like the Red Sea when you walk into a room. Everyone would like that, and that's easy to like. If I ask you, what do you want out of life, and you say something like, well, I want to be happy and have a great family and a job I like, well, that's ubiquitous, and it does not even mean anything. There's, there's no specificity to it. A more interesting question, a question that perhaps he's writing here that you've never considered before, is what pain do you want in your life? What are you willing to struggle for? Because that seems to be a great determinant of how our lives turn out. Not our happiness, but our pain. What we're willing to struggle for, what we're willing to suffer for. Everyone wants to have an amazing job and financial independence. But not everyone wants to suffer through six-hour work weeks, long commutes, obnoxious paperwork, to navigate corporate hierarchies and the confines of an infinite cubicle hell. People want to be rich without the risk, without the sacrifice, without the delayed gratification necessary to accumulate wealth. Because happiness, this is him writing, but I think he's got some truth here. Happiness requires struggle. The positive is the side effect of handling the negative. You can only avoid negative experiences for so long before they come back roaring into your life. And some of you would say amen to that. You've experienced that. You know, I think he gets to the crux of the issue. We generally want the best out of life without having to sacrifice or struggle for it. How many young people want the home, the cars, and the lifestyle that their parents struggled and sacrificed 30 years for, but they want it now? We try to avoid or minimize any type of suffering that comes with sacrifice. As one famous line goes, there is no gain without pain. And this is true as well in the Christian life. We want the blessings of God, yet we are not willing to count the cost. Jesus warned his disciples in Matthew chapter 16. He says, if anyone would come after him, me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will what? Find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Clearly the blessings of God's great mercy that has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, and that is kept in heaven for us, will come through sacrifice. Both Christ and ours. This is very evident as we live out our faith in a world that is hostile to God and His Word. You and I live in a world that is at war. It's at war in politics, culture, social structures, gender, and even religion. 
Yet Peter addresses the command of God for his children to willingly submit in all areas of our lives so that we may reclaim the excellencies of God who has called us from darkness into his marvelous light. And as children of God, we recognize that all authority are agents of God and that he uses them to accomplish his purposes. We must understand that God expects this of us, whether those authorities are good or evil, though we are never compelled to approve, affirm, or follow them in their evil deeds. Our obedience, we have learned these past few weeks, will serve to be a witness of Christ's work in our lives to unbelievers. One pastor notes that Peter is encouraging believers on how to live in the midst of of a hostile society, how to conduct ourselves in a world that is set against us. He remarks that if we are to have an impact in our culture, we must submit to the social order, to the social structure, and the social patterns that God has designed. We cannot be rebels. We cannot demand our rights. We cannot feel superior to that social order. With the privilege of being a child of God comes responsibility. Again, the background of these commands is the responsibility of these believers to proclaim the excellency of God, to share with them that God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And one of the biggest ways we can accomplish this is to live contrary to the world, which means that you and I respond to suffering different than the world. Our lives should be different, markedly so. How we respond to each other and to suffering is a key to effective witnessing. Peter is writing how they are to respond to each other in a covenant community as children of God. He has instructed them how to live in community with each other peacefully. In the passage of the past few weeks, believers are called to humbleness in submitting, faithfulness to God in serving, witnessing to unbelievers, and enduring suffering to the glory of God. In today's passage, we reach the conclusions of Peter's theme of submission that started in chapter 2, verse 11. So with that 1 Peter chapter 3, let's read out loud, if you would silently along with me, verses 8 through 12. Peter writes, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, But on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who who do evil. Father, open our minds and hearts this morning to hear your word. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would have free reign, that we would not quench it. Lord, keep us calm and in our seats and and attentive to your word. Let us be able to divine between what is your truth and what is mere opinion. And may it be clear. And may your spirit provoke us to respond in such a way that it draws closer to you. We thank you for this opportunity. In your name we pray. Peter writes finally, bringing to conclusion the topic of submission in the life of a believer. He has already addressed the relationship between believers and government authorities, in work, and in social structures, and in last week in marriage. Here Peter concludes by addressing the whole community of elect exiles in Asia Minor and their relationship with each other in covenant community. Peter is addressing how they are to respond to each other in church life. We will again follow the simple pattern that has been repeated throughout this section of Peter's letter as precept, principle, and person. The precept, the command that Peter is writing is for the covenant community to display the attitude and action of humility shown through the submission of the believer of his own interest to that of the body. 
Peter again echoes the words of Paul in his letter to the church of Philippi when he says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, if there's any participation in the Spirit, if there's any affection and sympathy, complete my joy of being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Peter here uses five adjectives as descriptors that these Christians and brothers and, brothers and sisters are to emulate. The first one is unity of mind. He commands them to be unity of mind. Peter, like Jesus and Paul, understood the importance of being like-minded is necessary for there to be harmony in the church. The psalmist sings how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. The apostle Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, he says, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all in all. He has called us to have a unity of mind. Peter understood that just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are still one body. And so it is with Christ. For he says, in one spirit we were all baptized into that one body. Jews and Greeks, slaves or free, all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. That there may be no division in the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. As Peter is writing, he's saying, listen, you as the church, the local church, you must have a unity of mind. He did not want to hear that there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, or slander, or gossip, conceit, and disorder in the church of God. And to combat against the temptation, to succumb to these attitudes, Paul wrote to the church of Rome to walk properly in the daytime. Not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus and to make no provision for the satisfaction of desires. Both Peter and Paul understood and agreed with James the elder of the church of Jerusalem who wrote, what causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war against you or within you? You desire, you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. No, there is to be no division in the body of Christ. For how could they be proclaiming the excellencies of God if they are fighting among themselves? How could they demonstrate the love of God for their brothers and sisters in Christ if they were self-absorbed? It would be impossible. Their witness would be destroyed. There would, they would be no different from the world. The Old Testament prophet Amos cries out, Do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? The answer, of course, is they cannot. It's important for you to understand that Scripture teaches that unity for the Christian church, for the body of Christ, is central to the gospel. That unity glorifies God's wisdom. And that unity is the responsibility of church members. Probably many of us, if you've been to church at any time, have been in a church in which the unity of the mind is broken, in which there's division. It's sad to say that even here we, uh, seven, eight, nine years ago, experienced this, and so many churches before us have. And there's no, uh, really, it's very difficult sometimes to prevent this happening, but it, it comes not just in the pastor and the elders, but it comes to the church members who say that we must have a unity of mind. So the question we have to ask, so what are we being about like minded? Is this being about groupthink? Is it about being lockstep? Is it about not having our own mind and, and, and saying it? Are we not to think? Is this a, a cult? No. The Bible tells us that our unity is based on four different things, and these are here on the monitor for those who like to take notes. Is that our unity in action by loving each other. John tells us in his gospel that Jesus said, a new command I give you, 
to love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men, men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So there must be a unity in our action that we love and care for each other. There's also a unity in purpose and understand that we're to demonstrate the glory of God in His vindication of the gospel. For the Bible tells us that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You and I need to understand that we're not here for our own agenda. We're not here as some type of hobby horse or social club. But our goal here, our purpose, is to glorify God by making known the manifold wisdom of God. The gospel. So our purpose must be together and understood that we're to glorify God in the vindication of his gospel. The third is the unity and source, the unity and the source of love through Christ. My prayer is not for them alone, John says, as Jesus prayed. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message that they may be one, that they may know that you love me and have loved them. In other words, our source of our unity is the love of God, the love of Christ that Paul says constrains us, that compels us to care for one another. That's the source that enables us to do so. And then lastly, unity in place as found in the local church. As we many times neglect this very important one, that God has called us to unite not only in the universal church, but also in the visible church, that we unite together. For all believers were in one heart and one mind, we read earlier. With great power, the, the, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of Christ, with my, and much grace was upon them. Is that we come together each week to hear God's word, to encourage and to serve each other. As a church, we work together to display God's perfect character as imperfect people. So the first is unity of mind. The second descriptor, the second way in which we are, to, we are commanded, is to have sympathy. Peter is commanding them to consider each other with compassion. In Romans 12, Paul wrote for the church to contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality and to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. To seek to show hospitality in all ways. You could imagine that many of these first century Christians would have suffered much from family, friends, and foe alike. Many were probably abandoned by their loved ones for refusing to worship the pagan gods and turning to Christ. A convicted man who was crucified on a Roman cross, betrayed by his own friend, and rejected and condemned by his own people. I remember as I was a young man, I was probably in early high school, and there was a college man who started coming to our church from a college not too far away. A friend of his brought him. And this guy was dynamic. He was a, a you know, I kind of looked up to him. He was tall, blonde, you know, blue eyes. He was going to be a pastor, and he just loved God. But as I got to know his story, you could see that, that things were not always well with him, and you could almost sometimes see a sadness. And then I heard the story that he had come to Christ as a young man, right before high school ended. And his parents were atheists. They did not believe in God. And when he told them that he had become a Christian, and his desire was to go to a Christian college and become a pastor, his parents actually um, abandoned him. They, what's it, they disowned him. They actually legally disowned him uh, and sent him away and had nothing to do with him. And it was only because of the love of that church that he would come down once or twice during the week and they would just come around and love him. He would have his mother's and father's there. He would have his uncles and his aunts and his spiritual grandpas and grandmas there. And in many ways, that has happened throughout the time in our life as God has taken us from one place to another further and further away from our own family. But there's a sympathy there. Understand that many times we can feel alone. This would have left those first century Christians a feeling alone without any emotional and financial support that they may have enjoyed before coming to Christ. That is Paul, why Paul would write to the church of Thessalonica to encourage the faint-hearted, to help the weak, and be patient with them all. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Colossians chapter 3. Paul writes to the church of Colossae about the new self and how you and I are to set our minds on heavenly things. 
In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul writes this to this church. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving one another. We're to have sympathy for each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. God's children and God's church should be marked with the people with kind, compassionate hearts for one another. And this leads us now to the third characteristic. He says you ought to have brotherly love. As we read earlier, one of the commands of Christ was to love one another. As children of God, we have a new relationship with those that have repented of their dead works and have trusted in Christ's work for salvation. You might remember Jesus' response in Matthew 12. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, Jesus' mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hands towards his disciples, he said, Here are my brothers, or my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. You and I are no longer strangers or just friends or acquaintances. You and I are brothers and sisters in Christ and all that that would entail. Paul would write of this Christian brotherhood to the different churches when he says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. In Hebrews, he says, Let brotherly love continue. In Hebrews, he says, Let us consider how to love one another to good works and not neglecting to meet each other, but encouraging one another. This love is in full display throughout Scripture. Our love then should be on full display towards one another. This will baffle the world as they see how we respond to each other in love. As Paul wrote, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. You and I are to love one another. The fourth is a tender heart. He commands them to have a tender heart. Now this is similar to compassion, though it's with more emphasis on action. It is not only compassion having sympathy for someone, but it's also a move to action to help alleviate the condition that brings the sympathy. Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave us. It is incumbent on believers to put aside bitterness, anger, and grudges that we may treat each other with love and kindness. And then humble mind is the fifth and last. This description means to be friendly, to consider each other as friends, not as opponents or adversaries. Again, Paul points out that we're to outdo one another in showing honor and contribute to the needs of saints and seek to show hospitality to one another. Thomas Schreiner, a theologian, notes that humility was something that was scorned by the Greco-Roman world. This type of behavior would be very distinct among the Christians. This distinction would have pointed straight to Christ to exhibit each and every one of these characteristics. So Paul calls them to obedience in Christ, submission, to have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, and a humble mind. In verse 9, as we go on, I believe Peter now is writing on how to respond to those outside of the church. Look at verse 9. Paul writes, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. The reason I say that this is responding to those outside, before he was saying, in the church, these descriptions should be common. This is how you take care of one another. This is how the family should function because you're going to be distinct from the world. How you respond to the suffering that comes is going to be uniquely shown in the church. But now something different is happening. And the reason I say this because it describes attitudes and actions that are not Christ-like. In other words, do not repay evil for evil. He's saying, if someone is evil to you, do not be evil back. If they revile you, don't revile. Now, 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 I'll admit that these attitudes and actions can 
and have happened in the church of God. But it should not be normative. These actions actually would sure show who to serve to show who is and who is not a child of God. Not that we're perfect again, but that if these attitudes and actions are prevalent in the body of Christ without repentance and confession in someone's life, then they are to be warned that their eternal soul is actually in danger. Jesus himself taught, But I say to you, to anyone who is angry with a brother, you will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if Jesus here, or Peter, is speaking about outsiders, as I believe he is, then Peter is warning them not to respond to the taunts and the persecutions they were suffering from those outside the church. If he is still speaking to the church at whole, the principle will hold, but I believe he's speaking a little bit greater outside. Now this could include family, former friends, and foe alike. The, po- the apostles were masters at this, as we read in the book of Acts, and we read of their constant persecutions and hardships they suffered for the cause of Christ. Paul describes his response to the harshness of others to him when he says, when we're reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. When we're slandered, we entreat it. If I would say, I would say this, if these types of things are happening in the church, then the church needs to be involved. Though not in the same way, you and I are beginning to experience this type of attitude from outsiders towards the church as a whole and some churches specifically. The world is hostile to our faith. Our response to this speaks volumes about our trust in God and the love of Christ that compels us to be salt and light that some may see and come to know him. Peter was certainly, uh, certainly remembered the teaching of his Savior who taught him to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive them the debtors. And judge not that you'll be not judged. Condemn not and you'll be not condemned. But forgive and you'll be forgiven. The good Dr. Luke, the traveling companion of the Apostle Paul and the early church historian, would record the words of Jesus who taught his disciples. But I say to you here who love your, enemy, or love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Jesus would go on to teach them to the one who strikes you on the cheek after uh, cheek offer the other one and from the one who takes away your cloak do not withhold your tunic either you see these words are echoed by apostle paul who wrote to the roman church that was experienced great persecution from nero when he says bless those who persecute you bless and do not curse them for he no evil one evil for evil but give thought to do is honorable in the sight of all Beloved, never avenge yourselves, he warns, but leave it to the wrath of God, for his written vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. To the contrary, Jesus taught, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Again, Peter and Paul echoing the same thing. These things now lead us to the principle. Why should we have this mind within the church? Why should we have this mind and these actions to those outside? It's the principle, the why of the command. We are to adopt these attitudes and actions because you and I are called to suffer through submission to one another, which leads to reward. Look at verse 9b, the last part of verse 9. Peter writes, but on the contrary... Instead of doing that, responding to these men this way, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. The evidence of one who has been redeemed is his response to suffering is blessing, is reward. We were called to respond differently from the world. As children of God, you and I receive a reward for following through and carrying our cross of suffering. And you say, what does this do with submission? What does this do with suffering? Well, for you and I to do these things, the five things within the church, and these several things here outside the world, you and I are going to have to submit to that type of behavior that is anti-against that. A humble mind means we must think of others. We must not seek to serve ourselves and to serve to demand our rights back. We don't respond as the world. So we submit to that many times. We endure that suffering that comes from those who want to attack us and persecute us. 
Peter quotes in Psalms 34 to flesh this out. Let's look at verse 10 and 11 in 1 Peter chapter 3. For he goes on to say, talking about how we obtain a blessing. He says, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. This psalm, the Psalm 34 that Peter is quoting, focuses on suffering and the Lord's deliverance in the midst of that suffering in David's life. Now, let me warn you, this is not a promise for happiness today, but a promise for eternal happiness that's found in the companionship of God. Peter uses the promise of the psalmist to teach that we are endure, we, we endure suffering now, looking forward to that internal inheritance that's waiting for us. Instead of defending ourselves, demanding our rights, or deterring suffering, you and I submit to God's word in responding to others when they attack us, offend us, or seek to destroy us. Though this may lead to a difficult life now, and it will, it leads to an inheritance that Peter tells us that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, that is kept in heaven for you and I. Amen? So he's called us to endure the submission of humility within the church and from those outside. Now, let's be careful not to think that this is teaching works righteousness or obtaining salvation through good works. He's not teaching that if you do these things, then that's how you receive the blessing. It's not teaching that all we have to do is live disciplined lives or control our tongue or do good works to be saved. As one theologian remarks, that blessing is not earned by the performance of good works, it is nevertheless belong to those who demonstrate good works. Kind of in tune with Dustin has been teaching on Sunday mornings. In verse 11, believers are called to action, not passivity. In other words, many think that what we need to do is we should just sit and meditate. We should conjugate Latin and Greek verbs in our spare time and just sit there and um, um, just get away from the world. And then we'll have peace. And that's all that God has called us to. But both Peter and the psalmist are agreeing and teaching that a child of God does two things to obtain this, this blessing, to have a happy life, a joy-filled life. First, the child of God must make a conscious effort to choose good. He says, whoever does love life and sees good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking, to, uh, speaking deceit. We make, must make a conscious effort to choose good. You in each and every day, as soon as you wake up, you are just uh, faced with multiple choices and decisions to live godly or to respond ungodly. And I will share with you that when the first words out of your mouth is, Lord, have mercy. Let your grace shine on me. Give me the strength to choose you this morning. The first thing you're going to do before you put on your clothes, your shoes, your makeup, or brush your teeth is put on the cross and be ready to carry it. It's like the man who said, Lord, I just thank you today. I have not cussed. I haven't had a bad thought. I haven't kicked the dog, yell at my wife. Lord, I haven't even been mad or anything all day. But Lord, now I'm getting out of bed. We think we're all good. Let me share with you that we make a conscious effort to choose good. The second thing that a child of God does, if you're taking notes, is that he devotes himself to action to promote peace. For he says, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. There's a proactiveness. Not only in the way we respond, but we're looking for ways to promote peace and devote ourselves to that type of action. It's in this way that Peter and the psalmist is saying we bless the world. As Jesus taught in the Sermon on, on, Sermon on the Mount, you know these. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Or the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are those who when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. He says, rejoice and be glad. Why? For your reward is great 
in heaven. For you will receive mercy. You shall be satisfied. You will be uh, called sons of God. This is what Peter writes. When he says, when you respond to suffering through submission and you endure it for the sake of God, you obtain a reward, an eternal inheritance. One theologian notes that living a godly life does not earn salvation, but is evidence of it. A transformed life is necessary to obtain inheritance. Again, coinciding with what we learned earlier in our adult Sunday school. And I, let me give you a free uh, a commercial. I would encourage you to join with us. Come a little bit earlier at 945 uh, to 1030. Uh, we have our adult Sunday school. Right now we're going through many of the most uh, important doctrines of, the, uh, of our faith. And so I encourage you for that. Now, this leads us to verse 12 and the person that the command points to. In verse 12, we read that the Lord now looks and sees the righteousness and judges evil. Look at verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You see, the Lord sees and hears and he acts accordingly. Scripture warns us that God will render to each one according to his works and that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that we may receive what is due for what has been done in the body, whether it's good or evil. God is all-knowing, all-powerful. There is nothing that escapes his attention. David lamented, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know where I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far. You search out my path and my laying down. And you're acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, Lord, you know it all together. Where should I go from your spirit? Where should I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the grave, you are there. Where can you run or hide from the Almighty? Job could not hide from God. Jonah could not run from God, nor could Saul who persecuted the church until miraculously called by God. The, father eye, the father's eyes are opened as Jesus informed the woman at the well that the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth. For the father, look at this, the father is seeking such people to worship him. God sees all. And he's seeking those who worship him. He hears their prayers and he brings them comfort, especially during times of suffering. We can endure suffering as we live as salt and light in this present darkness. As you and I renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now this type of living, you and I must understand, is not normative. To have these types of actions within our church and in our response to those outside is not normative. You and I cannot respond to each other in the world without the supernatural moving of the Holy Spirit in regenerating our hearts. For it is God who makes us sufficient for these things. You see, sin keeps us from doing this in our own power. Scripture teaches us that all have sinned and that all have gone their own way. The Bible tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. In sin, we seek out our own good at the expense of others. We are self-seeking, self-promoting, and self-absorbed. Wayne Grubin defines sin as our failure in our actions, in our attitudes, in our nature to conform to God's moral laws. We wonder why is it that someone acts bad? And what we try to do is we try to do behavior modification to say, let's make us a better person. But the problem is you and I cannot conform to God's moral law in our actions to the Ten Commandments and to the law of God. And you say, why? I try harder. I'm trying to self-improve. But the problem is, it's not so much our actions. It's our attitudes. You see, our attitudes are bad. So then what we tell is, that boy needs a self-adjustment. He needs an attitude adjustment. Anyone ever use that phrase? He needs an attitude adjustment. So then we go, and we try to change the way they think. 
And there are some good ones. AA has done that and many of those types of programs. Uh, prison, in some ways, tries to do that. We try to change the way people think. And so if I can change the way he thinks, I can change the way he behaves. And there is a truth to that. If you want to change someone, and I, you know, I used to do this as a, in, a, in a Christian school. I was a, a motivator. And my job was to help young people get on track in education. Well, I realized that I cannot change their actions unless I change their attitude. I had to help them think differently. However, the problem is you and I have all these people who try to, try to try to change the way we think so they can change our actions, but the problem is it's our nature. We only act and think because our nature is sinful and corrupt. And so what you and I need is not just new actions or new attitudes. What you and I need is a new nature. To accomplish these types of attitude and actions, we need a new nature. We don't need self-improvement. We don't need self-adjustment or self-renewal. You and I need a Savior. Peter has been laying this foundation from the beginning of his letter. Only a child of God is able to live out these attitudes and actions because we have, by the mercy of God, been given a new nature. In his second letter, Peter will write, it's here on the screen. Peter will write this. God's divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us by his precious and very great promises so that through them you may be, uh, become partakers of this divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. If you and I are going to endure suffering, by submitting to each other in covenant community, and by submitting to those outside, by loving those who are hostile to us, you and I need that new nature. Only then can our attitudes be changed, and then will it show through our actions. And so I would encourage you to stay. If you have not yet received that new nature, if you have not yet repented of your dead works, recognizing that your good works will not get you into heaven, and that it's only by a trusting that God has been satisfied in the works of Christ, and you accept that and call upon the name of the Lord, then you can have that new nature. He promises that he'll change the way he thinks, and that the Spirit will strengthen us and give us the ability to carry this out in the church and in our lives. So let me ask you, what does this look like? What prevents this from happening? Well, obviously... In a church, you can have those that are regenerated and a church that's those who are not regenerated. Believers and unbelievers. And by the way, members does not, being a member does not make you saved and being an unmember, not a member, does not make you not saved. There is going to be a mix in any body of people. But I would challenge you, if you do not know Christ, come to him today. If you do know Christ, then it's time to take up your cross and to follow him submission. Take your Bibles, if you would, for one last time, and turn to Acts chapter 2. For this passage gives us a glimpse into the first New Testament church in Jerusalem. And in the scripture we read that, that after Peter's preaching that we read earlier in our scripture reading from Randy, he had read those who received Peter's words were baptized, and there were added in that day 3,000 souls. Could you imagine a church growing by 3,000 people in one day? And then all of a sudden, now you've got to have brotherly love, you've got to have sympathy, you've got to have a humble mind, you have to have to unity with all these 3,000 people, many of them strangers. And that church just continued to grow and grow. But look, at they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and the fellowship, the breaking the bread and the prayer. But Luke goes on to record what we see a glimpse in that New Testament church as they repented of their sins, they trusted in what the Word of God says, and they voted themselves to their teaching. Look at verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions, belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, they were breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those 
who were being saved. And you can see that this commonality and this love for each other in this passage. Turn over probably maybe just one page to chapter 4. And I will end there. For this can be the local church today. This is not something that is, is something that cannot be replicated. This is the, the will of God for the church today. Look at Acts chapter 4, starting with verse 4, 32. Now the church has grown much larger now. It's well past the 3,000 stage. Now the full number of those who believed were of what? One heart and one soul. And no one sold or no one said that any of the things that belonged to them was his own, but they had everything in common. Verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. There right there is the gospel. And great grace was falling upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. Brotherly love, you see, you humble of mind, a unity, and it laid it at the apostles' feet and was distributed to each as any had need. You see a tenderheartedness there. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostle Barnabas, and I love what's in parentheses here, which means son of encouragement. We need more Barnabases in our church, both male and female. He was a Levite, a native of Cyprus. He sold a field that belonged to him, and he brought the money, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Whoa! Wouldn't it be wonderful if this was said of OBBC? And our members, and our people here, that we have a unity of mind, a sympathetic and tender heart, that we're humble of mind, having all things in common, in which we are loving and caring for each other and helping each other as we go out from the work and we look at those who are hostile to us. This ought to be a place of refuge. This ought to be a place of strengthening, a place of building up. May God grant us the same love and care for each other as you and I endure suffering together. May God be glorified in the submission of his people, for it leads to life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, with worship team, if you'd please come up. Just take a moment to pause, to consider, to pray and respond to the Holy Spirit. One, are you a Christian? Do you know Christ? Are you a child of God? If not, would you come and would you ask at the end of the service, Randy will be up here in the front and Dustin, and they can share with you how you too can know today, you can leave here today to know whether or not you're a child of God. We invite you to know today. If you are a child of God, have you, have you joined a church? Have you become part of that church or part of that? Have you committed to them, knowing that you're going to serve there in love? And as a member, are you, are you including these types? Are you praying and are you enacting these types of actions and attitudes in your mind and heart? And are you preparing yourself and praying for one another that we may be endure the suffering from those that may be hostile to our faith, that we may proclaim the excellencies of God? Would you commit to that this morning? Would you just ask God to give me the strength, make me sufficient, help me to understand how to do that, and let the Holy Spirit Apply it to your life where you are. Would you take a moment to pause, to consider, to pray, and respond to the Holy Spirit's work? Father, you're so good to us. I know that I'm not sufficient for these things. I desire to be so. I desire to pick up my cross and endure the suffering with gratitude and humbleness of mind and heart. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for saving us. But now, Father, let OVBC be a church, Lord, that is, that is uh, glorifying to you. May this be a place where people, brothers and sisters, know that they are loved and cared for. Allow us to do such things. May we open our heart and be ready to receive those that you would add to our church. And then, Father, strengthen me, strengthen us. Lord, prepare us. Lord, to proclaim your excellency. Lord, as we don't seek our dem or demand our rights, but we willingly love and forgive those, Lord, who are hostile to us. We thank you for this opportunity. In your name we pray.
Amen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Walking in Faith. We encourage you to share this with others. If you have any questions or comments, please visit us online or email us at info at orangevilla.org. Till next time, may God bless you in everything you do.